Hello and welcome to this second video uh, where we're looking at the basic uh, nature of waves and today what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the nature of longitudinal and also transverse waves. So we're going to start off with transverse waves. This is the one that um, mostly is concentrated on at GCSE. Um, it's the one with peaks and troughs and you can, and, uh, as we saw in the last video, you can define the wavelength and also the amplitude of this wave. The important thing about this wave is its definition. This is a definition that you must learn um, and basically it describes the motion of one of these particles. So you can see that in this transverse wave the oscillation of the particles, so this particle here, so this oscillation is perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. What we mean by that is for this particular wave, as you can see, the, 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 the wave is moving in this direction. So that's the direction that the energy is moving. So the energy is moving in that direction, um, but the oscillations, the actual movement of these particles is, is at 90 degrees to that because they're moving up and down. So the angle between those is 90 degrees. In other words, the energy transfer in this direction and the oscillations this direction are at 90 degrees to each other. They are perpendicular to each other. This definition you have to know. Now, um, Examples of these waves are all electromagnetic waves. So you, you can be asked to give two examples, for example, of a, of a transverse wave. All electromagnetic waves, all seven, so radio waves, microwaves, infrared, uh, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. So all of those, they're all transverse waves. And other examples, things like water waves, potentially waves on a rope. Really, if you're asked for um, a wave that is a transverse wave that's not an electromagnetic wave, always write this one down. If you're just asked for an example of a transverse wave, any one of the electromagnetic waves, really. So, um, here we've got a worked example. Um, but Because really, when it comes to transverse waves, they can, they, they can ask you to basically to define a transverse wave. They can also ask you to basically write down the difference between a transverse and longitudinal wave. We'll have a look at that in a sec. They can also do things like this. So here's, here's a picture of a wave. We've got a particle at A, which is this one here. Um, we have to we're being asked to describe the motion of the particle A over the next full time period. So if we remember um, from last time, so well, let's put what I'd, if you remember from last time, what I'd like you to do is really start to like write down all of the information in the question. So you can underline keywords, but really write down what information you've got. So we've got a transverse wave. We know it's transverse because you can see the shape of it. It's moving from left to right, so it's useful to put a arrow on here just to show which direction the energy is moving. So it's moving from left to right in that direction. Um, and we need to describe the motion of this particle at point A, so there, over the next full time period. Okay, now if you remember from last time, the, the time period is the amount of time it takes to these particles to perform one full oscillation. So we have to describe the motion of this particle once it gets back to this point here, going in the same direction that it was at this point here. So the first tricky bit is deciding which way the, this particle is going to go. Is it going to move upwards or going to go downwards? The easiest way is to kind of draw what the wave would look like a little bit later on. So because it's moving in this direction, the wave's going to look something like this. And it's only rough, but it only it doesn't need to be particularly artistic. So it's going to have moved to there. So if you think about it, the particle will be won't be there anymore. A little time later, it will be down here. So that's definitely within the first quarter of a wavelength because this peak, otherwise this peak would have got to this point here. So that's in that's the first quarter of a time period. So we know for a fact that these the particle f is going is going to go downwards, then it's going to go upwards, and then it's going to go back down again. So it's just how you describe that really. So I've written that out already. Once as soon as you've decided in which direction it's going to go, then it's just a matter of writing out exactly what's happening. You have to get into the habit of being really specific. Because it says over the next full time period, basically it does four things. It moves downwards until it gets to the maximum negative displacement. It then in, and it does that in a quarter of a time period. It then moves up back to the equilibrium line, and that takes another quarter of a time period, and then it keeps on going. So another so after three quarters of a time period it will be at its maximum positive displacement, and then after a full time period it will get back to where 
you know, get back to the equilibrium line, which is basically um, what we're asked to describe. So if we were, if we, I've written that down, so we're basically we've got the particle moves downwards. So that's important because you're saying in which direction it's moving first of all, to its maximum negative displacement. In other words, it's going from there down to there, and it takes a quarter of a time period to do that. So you've you've explained the first quarter of the motion. In the next quarter of a time period, it moves back up to the equilibrium line. So we've gone down another quarter of a time period, gone back up to the line. It then moves up to its maximum positive displacement in the third quarter of a time period, up to there, and then back down to the equilibrium line after one whole time period. So really, it's a very, very simple question. Um, you, can, you just have to break it down into all of the important parts. So that was transverse waves. Um, in longitudinal waves, um, longitudinal waves, as you will have learned at GCSE, basically are sat. The, the, the classic one is sound. Some earthquakes are also um, longitudinal waves, but sound is the one that you really, really need to remember. Other examples, as well as a couple, one of the two earthquake um, waves, um, but the one's a longitudinal, one, one's a transverse wave one. Um, but in terms of classic longitudinal waves, sound, is the one that you really need to know. Um, you can also make longitudinal waves on a slinky by moving the ends backwards and forwards. And it looks a little bit like this. Again, there's there's movement of um, energy. And you can see that, because if you look at these this point where all the particles are close together, it's moving in this direction. So there's another one here, look. And it's easy to see that it's moving in this direction. So energy is moving in that direction there. Now, if you take one of these particles, this one here, for example, you can see that it's also moving in the same direction. Now it doesn't go all the way from this end to this end because as we saw in the first video, the matter, the particles, don't actually move from one end of the wave to the other way. All they do is basically oscillate. So they, they move around a certain equilibrium position. So look at this one, it goes to the left, then it goes back to the right, and then it goes back to the left again. So it's going backwards and forwards. So the direction that the the particles that oscillate in is this one. So they're in the same direction, but that's not what we want to say. We will basically want this definition here. So you've got your definition of a longitudinal wave, and in this case, the oscillations are parallel to the direction of energy transfer. So really, it's exactly the same definition as a transverse wave, apart from we've just changed this word here from perpendicular to parallel, because if we compare them, they look exactly the same oscillations are perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer oops and oscillations are parallel to the direction of energy transfer also now that we've looked at both waves say this don't say it's the direction that the wave is moving or sometimes you can get just about get away with direction of propagation this one will always get you the marks so direction of energy transfer is incredibly important so that's a longitudinal wave if you look at it in a bit more detail, instead of particles, what we've drawn is drawn lines instead. So each one of these lines basically represents the position of a particle. So if you go back to here, for example, here's our animation. You've got particles that are close together and particles that are far apart. If we'd have drawn lines instead of dots, then what you'd have ended up with is basically this picture here. There are a couple of terms that you need to know. Um, they're not strictly definitions, but it's just something that you need to. Uh, it's just something you need to know really. Um, there are two parts of this wave. There are compressions and rarefactions. Compressions are basically where the particles are closer together than where they would be normally. Normally, if there was, if the wave wasn't here, all of these, all of these particles or the lines representing the positions of the particles would all be equally spaced like that. But because the wave, the energy is moving through this thing, through this medium where these particles are, some get bunched together and some are forced further apart. And because of the other way that the, the wave oscillates, the compression, is, which is the easiest one to see, you can kind of see move through the wave as we saw on the animation. So compression is where the particles are closer together than when they normally are in equilibrium. A rarefaction is where they're further apart. Um, so you've got compression, 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 a rarefaction here, rarefaction here. Um, if you're ever asked to measure or calculate the wavelength of one of these longitudinal waves, which is a little bit tricky to be really honest with you, but you can do it. Um, if you take um, the middle of a compression here and the middle of a compression here, that will give you the wavelength of that. You can do the same thing with the rarefactions because there's one wavelength difference between a compression 
and the next compression or between a rarefaction and another rarefaction. That's kind of hard to do because it's very difficult to actually work out exactly where the middle of the compressions are, but, but you can do it. But that's just, if you're asked to label it, that's what it would look like. Now, there are, there's kind of an app, one application um, that depends upon whether waves are either longitudinal or transverse. And that's an application called polarization. Now, normally when light is given out, it's given out in, in, in all sorts of different directions. Light, because it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum, is a transverse wave. So basically, so the, the oscillations are perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer, as you can see with this red thing. But um, they're given out in lots of different directions. So, um, for example, I've tried to draw it here. One of them's given out vertically. Um, there's another wave given out horizontally, and that's the green one, which is kind of going across waves like that. So the green one and the red one are at 90 degrees to each other. There's a purple one, which is at 45 degrees, and there'll be lots of other directions as well. So light that comes from your light bulb um, isn't all going in the same way. So um, that's that's a wave that we would say is unpolarized. Um, if, if we've got transverse waves that are going in lots and lots of different, we call these planes of oscillation. So we've got a vertical plane here, horizontal plane here, another plane here, and so on. Now we can choose um, one of these planes of oscillation. So what we would do is, if we've got light like this, for example, is that, to be honest, it's easier thinking about a rope. So let's imagine we've got a rope, and we, the rope is being, one rope is being wiggled up and downwards like that, so it's in the vertical plane. One rope is being wiggled from side to side, so you've got a wave horizontally. One rope is being wiggled at an angle, so it's kind of like in between the two. And then you put a fence in the way, and the fence has got gaps in it, and the, these gaps are vertical. You can imagine that the horizontal one, for definite, when the wave gets to here, it's going to hit these bars. So the wave isn't going to get through. So the rope on this side, isn't. there's going to be no wave, because this thing is going to absorb the energy from this thing, basically because the wave, so if you've got your two kind of like bars like that, and the waves, the wave can't oscillate from side to side, because it would hit these two bars. If, however, your wave, if it's coming straight towards you and it's oscillating up and down, it can come straight through. So we can choose one plane of oscillation, and in this case, we've chosen the vertical one. So we would then say that this wave has been polarized. If we'd have turned this grid round so it was horizontal instead, we'd have, we would have chosen the horizontal um, plane of oscillation, and the green wave would have got through, and the others wouldn't. And, and so we'd have got a different plane of polarization. So you would see less light here than there was to start with, because a lot of it is basically being blocked by this thing. Now, the really important thing is, if you think about this, only transverse waves can be polarised, because transverse waves, some of them, um, will hit these bars. Um, if it's a longitudinal wave, which is basically oscillating backwards and forwards, um, there is no way that they can hit the bars. No, you can't do anything with that whatsoever. Because it's oscillating through the bars, you can't polarise longitudinal waves. So that's really important. So often you're not, in an exam, you're not asked which waves can be polarised. You're given a situation and it's and you're told that um, basically as you rotate this, as we'll see in a bit, the intensity of the light decreases. Um, is it a transverse or long, longitudinal wave? And you say, well, it's a transverse wave because it is being polarised and only transverse waves can be. It's used in photography to reduce glare. Now, basically what happens is when, when you've got the sun like this, um, all the light from the sun is unpolarized, so, you, so you've got lots of different planes, in fact every single plane virtually of oscillation, um, you've got horizontal, vertical, every angle in between. When the light comes down and it hits the floor, so if it hits a puddle for example, the reflected light becomes polarized. Now if, you're, if you've got a camera or whatever and you're taking a picture of this thing, then you've got light coming from the sun, but you've also got reflected light coming from the puddle as well. So you're getting more light than you really want. So you get something called glare. So what you do is you put on a Polaroid filter. And what you do is you basically put on one filter like this, um, and all that will measure is basically one, or it will, all, all it will do is allow one plane of light to come through. So essentially it blocks this out. Um, and when it blocks that out, it reduces the glare that's coming from the puddle, but it's basically re reducing light coming from the reflections. Um, TV aerials are also oriented 
to absorb, it's an, there's an E on the end of that, I'll get rid of that, um, to absorb the maximum signal that you can possibly get. Um, again, if you think about it, if um, TV aerials, are, well, TV signals are often polarised, so if you put your aerial the right way up, it will receive all of the signal like this. If you put your aerial the wrong way, it will receive a really small signal, and so you won't be able to watch TV. Now, I mentioned before that you could basically turn these things around. This is kind of roughly what happens. So what I've done is I've, I've and we're going to look at two cases. We're going to look at a special case first where we've already got polarised light. So this light's already been polarised because we've got oscillations only in one plane. And in this case, it's only in the vertical plane. If we put this grid in the way, again, what we see is that because the grid is vertical and the oscillations are vertical, the light can just pass straight through it. And so you see all of the light coming through this grid. If you then rotate this round, so if you then turn this round a little bit, um, some of the light will still get through. So any, so but it'll be much reduced. So the amplitude of this will be reduced because some of the light rays, or or a portion, a component of the light is a better word. A component of the light ray will be blocked, but some will still be able to get through. And so you'll see some light over here. When you turn this round, so that this is now perpendicular to what it was before. So this is now at 90 degrees. So let's imagine we've got a protractor and we said that this was zero degrees. We then rotate this round so it's 90 degrees. Essentially what we've got is we've got light going, it's oscillating in a vertical plane. We've got two horizontal bars now. So because they're horizontal, they're in the, a completely different plane to this. And so basically it blocks all of the light out. So, and then if, if you then continue to rotate this, you'd get back to this one, and then if you rotated it back round, so it's at 180 degrees, you'd get this again. So what you'd get is you'd get, as you rotated the, the, this thing round, this Polaroid filter, which that's what this is called, as you rotate this Polaroid filter around, you would see the light disappear, it'd go dark, and then as you continue to rotate it up to back round to 180 degrees, it would get lighter again. Now, in, princip in, in, practice, in principle, that's fine. In practice, however, it, it, that won't work because, again, in, from a real light life source, like the sun or like a bulb or something like that, the light comes in lots, in many, many, many different planes, vertical, horizontal, lots of different angles. Um, so the only way that you can really kind of significantly reduce the light ray is essentially by um, using two Polaroid filters. So I'll, I'll write these on this time. So these things, these things are called Polaroid filters. If we're looking, if we're using light, and they work in the same way. You can imagine that there are basically these lines going through, and you've got all of these different planes of oscillations, and then when it gets to the first Polaroid filter, then what will happen is that it'll only let really let one plane of oscillation through. If we then put a second Polaroid filter here and it's aligned with the first Polaroid filter, it's like it's not even there and the light would just continue going through because this thing's already polarised and so it can go through the gaps and so that would make no difference whatsoever. If, however, you took this, this one here, and what you did is you rotated it, then what would happen is what you'd get is you'd get, you, you've made your, your light ray polarised so you've got a polarised light ray now. If you then rotated this round, what you'd get is you'd get essentially this situation. So you can imagine that this is just before this is your first Polaroid filter. And so you've got now your, your polarised light ray. And then as you turn this round, it, the intensity of the light, the brightness of the light gets less until that's at 90 degrees to the first one. So when this is at 90 degrees, Basically, the intensity of the light or the brightness of the of the light becomes zero, and then you rotate it round until you get to 180 degrees. So let's just write this down, just so we know what we're talking about. As you go from zero to 90 degrees, your intensity starts off bright because this all of this light ray is getting through. But then, as you rotate this one around like that to 90 degrees, this polaroid filter which is vertical and this polaroid filter becomes horizontal so the horizontal pol polaroid filter blocks out the vertical polarized light so the intensity decreases down to zero as you go from 90 to 180 
so you're going back to this situation, your intensity is going to increase. And then it would keep on going. Now there's a special name when this one is kind of vertical and this one is horizontal. And in that case, what you say is that the Polaroids the Polaroids are crossed. And that's easy to kind of imagine why it's called that. It basically means that the lines on this one and the lines on this one are actually at 90 degrees to each other, so they cross over each other. So if you have Polaroids that are crossed over, basically you get no intensity. If the Polaroids are kind of like parallel to each other, then you do. So you can plot a graph. If you start off with at zero degrees, like this, so this is at zero degrees, so they're lined up, you get big intensity. When you get to kind of like 90 degrees, which is here, then you get zero intensity. And then you get to 180 degrees. That means that this this thing here has been turned all the way back round again, so it's the right way up again. And so you'd get a maximum intensity up here like that. And then when you get to 270 degrees, then you've gone an extra 90 degrees again, so the Polaroids are crossed, and so you get zero. And so what you end up with is very roughly, you end up with a graph that looks something hopefully fairly smooth, like that. And if we go back up to 360 degrees, then the intensity would go back up to a maximum. And to be honest with you, if you rotated it the opposite way, so you rotated it that way instead, you could say that that's minus 90, and so this thing would be symmetric. So that's what polarization is. Um, it can only happen with transverse waves. You have two Polaroid filters. Um, you can't see the lines on real ones when you're using light. Um, but it, essentially that's kind of what's happening. The crystals within the Polaroid filters are, are basically blocking out all of the planes of oscillations of the light waves apart from one. And when you get cross Polaroids, you basically the intensity of your light or the brightness of the light becomes zero. So we had a really quick look at um, what a transverse wave was. And we said that this definition is one that you have to learn um, and gave a couple of examples of that. Um, we then um, looked at the kind of question you can get when it, when it comes to transverse waves, apart from just um, what the amplitude is and measuring the wavelength and so on. We then had a look at longitudinal waves, and again, we, there was a definition that you must, must learn. Um, I did say that sometimes they ask you what the difference is between a longitudinal and transverse wave, basically just write down the two definitions. So you'd say in a longitudinal wave, oscillations are parallel, whereas in a transverse wave the oscillations are perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer so if you know those two definitions you can answer that question um, and then we had a really really quick look at what polarization is in terms of the fact that polarization is essentially choosing one plane of oscillation of these transverse waves it only happens with transverse waves uh, there's a couple of uses there and then we got to this this concept of having crossed polaroids and if you have crossed polaroids you could essentially draw a graph that looks like that so that's it from me. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again soon.